Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us so early in the day for our weekly Republican Leadership Media Availability. I'm Kimberly Wirtz, Communications Director for the Washington State Senate Republican Caucus, and I'll be moderating today. The legislators who are participating with us are Senator, Senate Republican Leader John Braun from the 20th Legislative District, Senate Republican Whip Keith Wagoner from the 39th Legislative District, House Republican Leader Drew Stokesbury from the 31st Legislative District, and then I am told that uh, House Republican Assistant Floor Leader Chris Corey from the 14th Legislative District may also join us in, oh, there he is. Only he's mislabeled as Drew Stokesbury. <laughs> An honor, I'm sure. An impersonator. Okay, well, thanks for joining us, Representative Corey. And so we'll start off with opening comments from Senator Braun. All right, thank you, Kim, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here uh, to the the Republican press availability for the fourth week of session. Um, I have with me this morning, uh, Senator Keith Wagner, uh, who uh, serves as the whip and a, a key leader within our caucus. I'm just gonna start off by, you know, you know, reinforcing the things we've been focused on the whole session. Uh, we continue to work on public safety uh, and uh, and I'm not telling anybody any, anything they don't already know. We lead the country. We're near the top of the country in many things, from retail crime to uh, property, you know, to uh, property theft. Uh, sadly, to where we continue to break records on uh, on murder in our state. And yet, instead of trying to get after these issues, we have uh, the Democratic majority seem to be more focused on victim or on on the rights of criminals including a bill to allow serving uh, felons to serve on, to, to participate as part of the jury process uh, instead of focus on victim rights and reducing the amount of crime. And while we've had some positive comments from the majority about rebuilding our law enforcement group, the truth is we're the lowest in the, in the country. Uh, we're not doing any real, anything real, any of the hard problems, basically any of the hard problems to improve morale and improve recruiting that would drive those numbers up over the next few years. So, uh, we're a little frustrated. I'm certainly a little frustrated that we're not getting after the real problems out there. On affordability, the same sort of thing. You know, people in the state of Washington, especially folks living from paycheck to paycheck, are struggling uh, to get by. And instead of working on making things cheaper in our state, we continue to do things uh, to raise the cost. I'll just throw out a few examples. A lot of focus in the last couple of weeks on two uh, significant tax bills, uh, both a real estate excise tax, they call it a transfer tax, it's still an excise tax that would drive up the cost significantly for renters and also has the potential to drive up the cost for new homes as folks purchase large tracts of land to build, build new homes. So this is a bill that without question drives up costs at the very worst time in our state's history to do so. And then uh, when they're not talking about that, they're talking about increasing the growth rate on property tax. And I'll remind everybody here, that's a growth rate. A 1% cap was put in place by both of the people almost two decades ago. And, and once the state Supreme Court ruled unconstitutional, the legislature stepped in. Democratic-led legislature, I might add, stepped in and reinstated it. It's been in place for a long time. It served us well. This notion that it's necessary to support our, our local municipalities, counties, and cities, I think is just factually inaccurate. Lo go look at the growth rate of those budgets. You'll see their growth rate in their budgets is near the same uh, see, almost exactly the same over time as the state budget, and all of them are about double the growth rate of personal income. So somehow growing at twice the rate of your budget and my budget and everybody's budget, kitchen table budget is not enough. They have to increase property taxes. And again, this goes directly to one of the pre key issues having to do with affordability in our state, and that's housing, where you're going to live. It's going to drive up the cost of owning a house. It's going to drive up the cost of renting in our state. And we shouldn't do it. Uh, and then finally, on education, we, of course, continue to push on learning loss. But what I want to highlight uh, this morning is uh, the executive branch's uh, absolute failure when it comes to our, our juvenile criminal justice system. You saw uh, reporting just this last week about some of the failures of both uh, Green Hill, which is in my district, and Echo Glen, uh, that w where we have uh, easy access to drugs. There has have been cases of staff participating. There's suspicion that they're still participating. And, and there's very little being done on hiring practices, on security, on helping these uh, um, minors and young adults uh, get back on a better path when they leave there. We're putting them in an unsafe environment. We're not giving them the skills 
uh, to return to a normal life and be be successful. And, and frankly, we're 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 putting them in a, in a a situation where they could be they could they could die. I mean, we have had five overdoses in the last week and a half, almost two weeks now, uh, at Green Hill. That should be unacceptable. Uh, and and we see the executive branch just kind of glossing over glossing over it. So in terms of building a better future for our children from the K-12 public education system, which is failing them, failing to prepare them for career and college uh, to our juvenile criminal justice system, which is just making it unsafe and almost impossible to get back to a normal life. We are failing our children. We need to do better. So with all that uh, cheery news, I'm going to stop right there and turn it over to my colleague in the, in the House, Senator, uh, Representative Drew Stuxbury. Well, uh, thanks, Senator Broaden. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I, I'm afraid I, I don't have uh, much cheerier news from the House. The situation over here is largely the same. Uh, first, so let me introduce uh, one of my colleagues, Representative Chris Corey. Uh, I think you all might know him, but he is uh, our one of our caucus's assistant floor leaders, uh, which is elected by our caucus. He is also the new ranking member on appropriations uh, starting this session. Um, I, I'm going to echo a lot of what Senator Braun said. It's very similar to what the dynamic we've seen uh, in the House of Representatives for the first uh, 22 days, 23 days. Um, you know, House Republicans started session. Uh, I said on the first day that we want to fix the state's public safety crisis. Um, so we have proposals to uh, give cities and counties more money to hire more police officers. Uh, we think that we should roll back the police pursuit law that was changed several years ago so that police officers can actually go after and catch the bad guys. Um, Democrats have uh, unfortunately not entertained either of those ideas uh, and instead are giving hearings to bills that would do things like let Gary Ridgefield, uh, Gary Ridgeway vote, uh, serve on a jury, uh, put sex offenders on the sex offender policy board. Um, you know, just an absolutely stunning display of the differences between uh, our caucus's respective priorities. Um, it's not just public safety. Uh, Senator Braun uh, mentioned housing and affordability. Uh, that's another big one. Uh, Republicans think that we ought to do something to relieve the high price of gas that uh, Washingtonians have been having to pay under the Climate Commitment Act. Uh, we think that we shouldn't be the third highest um, uh, price state for, for new housing. Uh, we don't think we should have the fewest homes per, uh, fewest housing units per household uh, as, as we currently do. Um, so we have bills to uh, give, give gas rebates to folks, um, encourage and incentivize billing of, of more housing of all types. Um, you know, but instead, Democrats uh, aren't giving any attention to bills that would actually uh, solve the regressivity of the Climate Commitment Act they passed. Uh, and uh, they are doing everything they can to make housing more expensive by uh, trying to raise property taxes, trying to raise uh, real estate transfer taxes. Um, the, the, the list goes goes uh, on and on. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's an unfortunate reality, I think. Uh, but uh, I, I think uh, an interesting display and case study of what uh, our caucus's respective priorities are. The one other thing uh, that has occupied a lot of attention so far, and um, probably will for the next uh, forty something days, thirty something days, uh, are the initiatives. Um, all six initiatives of the legislature that were submitted to the Secretary of State have now been officially certified by Secretary Hobbs um, and introduced in the House and Senate and referred to respective committees. Uh, on the House floor, uh, for every for all six of the initiatives that were referred to committees, House Republicans made a motion to instruct those committees to hold a hearing. Uh, the state constitution says that initiatives to the legislature shall take precedence over all other measures. Uh, and we feel that that language has to mean something. And one way we proposed uh, satisfying that language was to instruct committees from the floor to hold hearings. Uh, that's not something we normally do. Uh, and that's exactly why we think it was a good idea here, because uh, it would have demonstrated to the public that uh, we are prioritizing these by requiring hearings rather than leaving it up to the committee chairs like we do for every other bill. Uh, unfortunately, every one of those motions to require a hearing was uh, defeated by the majority party on a party line vote. Um, every House Democrat voted to uh, oppose a hearing for each of those initiatives. Uh, and that's unfortunate because not only would that have satisfied, satisfied our constitutional obligation, um, I think it would have allowed the public to have a voice and role in the process beyond them uh, just being able to sign the initiative. 
Um, you know, we heard a variety of excuses why it couldn't happen. Uh, the, the majority leader said that uh, we don't normally do it, which, like I said a second ago, that, that's exactly the point. We don't do it for normal bills, uh, but we should do it for the initiatives. Uh, I think that the speaker has said, said last week that um, uh, there has been an, there have been initiatives to the legislature in the past, and uh, those didn't uh, necessarily all have hearings, so we shouldn't need to start now. Um, I don't think that's a very good reason. There's precedence in the U.S. Senate for senators um, beating each other with canes. Uh, if the mistake were the rule, then caning would be in order in the U.S. Senate. Uh, it's not. We shouldn't allow uh, our future uh, rules to be defined by the mistakes we made in the past. Uh, and lastly, we heard that um, you know there is uh, not enough time to hear all these initiatives because of all the other bills being introduced. But again, um, when the Public Safety Committee is hearing bills like putting sex, sex offenders on the sex offender policy board and uh, giving uh, murderers like uh, Gary, Gary Ridgway the right to vote and right to serve on a jury, um, makes me wonder what exactly uh, they, they need more time to do. Uh, so, you know, with, with that and, I, and on that cheery note, uh, I will open it up to questions. All right. Well, thank you very much. And we will start with Hallie Golden from the AP. Hallie, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Thank you, Kim. Um, so there's House and Senate bills that would add a series of um, pretty big worker protections and operational standards for adult entertainment establishments in Washington State. I was hoping to get your guys' thoughts on those bills. Um, you know, is this something that Republicans are supportive of? So I'm not familiar with the, the bill in the House. I'm not sure if it's the same. I did. I, am, I do sit on the Labor and Commerce Committee, and we heard that bill yesterday. Um, and, and I did hear it yesterday. We executed out of committee yesterday. I think most of the Republicans were with, without recommendation. Uh, there's still a lot of, uh, and if you if you were paying attention to that, you'll see there were probably six amendments, a, a new striker, and there's still a lot of uh, uncertainty as to what the right um, – right policy is here. I think everybody wants to make sure there's a safe work environment. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, but you know, not all of us are familiar with uh, that industry. And uh, understanding how you do that without causing harm has been somewhat of a challenge. So I would say, I, I know in the Senate that bill is alive. I also know that it's a, it's considered, I, I certainly by our side of the aisle, but I think also by the other side of the aisle to be a work in process and something we're still trying to sort through. Yeah, I, I'll just add, I have not seen the bill this session that's in the House, um, you know, but I'm generally aware of this issue. There is a bill dealing with it last session. Uh, I'll echo Senator Brown that I think our caucus uh, is, of course, going to uh, be supportive of ways to try to protect uh, employees in that industry. But like he said, you know, it, it's a challenging one to regulate because it's it's not one that, to my knowledge, uh, any of us comes to the legislature having real world experience in. Uh, and so, you know, for example, the last session, uh, when the bill was moving through the process at one point, folks realized that a drafting error was going to inadvertently legalize prostitution in the state of Washington, which I, I don't think anybody wanted. Um, so that effort sort of fizzled out, understandably so. So, I, you know, I think uh, while we certainly share a desire to make sure we're protecting workers, we we also want to make sure that we're, we're doing this correctly and striking the right balance um, uh, for not just the workers, but, uh, um, you know, communities and neighborhoods as well. Kelly, did you have a follow-up question? No, that, that was all I needed. Thank you. Okay. Next, we will go to Jerry Cornfield from the Washington State Standard. Go ahead, Jerry. Good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, <clears throat> one of my questions, which you kind of answered, you're not very cheery yet. <laughs> As a caucus, I think I asked if you would be happy earlier in the session. Uh, I'm not sure. Well, it'll be interesting to see if you are happy by the end of session. Uh, my question is related on transportation. Uh, you've been talking about affordability. And uh, yesterday, State Transportation Commission approved an increase in tolls on 405 and 167. And they did so at the re a bipartisan request of transportation leaders saying we need you know, we need more money because the projects in that corridor have gone up beyond engineer estimates. So I wonder if you could just talk about how the Republicans can support pressuring the commission to raise tolls, which is an affordability issue, and what are your answers for 
dealing with transportation this session? Well, first of all, I, I didn't know it, that wasn't a, a, a caucus position. Their request to increase tolls. I think that came. I, I don't even know who it came from. Presumably, our transportation leaders wasn't something we discussed. And I would say you wouldn't find a, a uniform opinion within our caucus. Um, I do understand the need to do additional work on some of these big projects, and their and the costs are skyrocketing. But it's just one of the many problems we have with transportation. You know, we we start with a. A foundation over the last three decades, we've had over reliance on on gas tax and excessive bonding uh, that's put us in a tough spot. Uh, we now have the effects of uh, inflation and over regulation driving up the cost on projects significantly. We have a gigantic backlog in maintenance that uh, drivers are certainly notices noticing in places like 405, but also on I-5 uh, that need to be done and. Um, we're kind of in a in a tough we're in a very tough spot and you know the reality is with the climate commitment act and the additional 50 to 60 cents a gallon that is placed on the cost of fuel you know any discussion uh of a gas tax is is a non-starter the mileage uh, miles driven tax or mile use tax is deeply unpopular on both sides of the aisle uh really the only significant option left and it's an option we have promoted for for many years now, is to supplement the transportation uh, budget from the operating budget. It's an option that many states, in fact, they'd say most states, use in one fashion or another. It's one we have proposed many times and one uh, we can still do. We have some savings mostly in the last two years, but also going forward uh, to our operating budget. That If we made the choice, if, if as a group, you know, we made the choice and Republicans certainly support this, to use that money to, to go to transportation instead of, you know, instead of growing the operating budget even more, uh, knowing that the operating budget is already very robust and very, you know, uh, it's, it's covering everything pretty well. We could make billions of dollars of additional investment in the transportation system and make a real difference in folks' lives and not have to uh, for force with very difficult decisions of either stopping progress on the work on 405 or raising tolls, both of which are bad options. Uh, but we have another option we could pursue if the Democratic majority were willing. We're certainly willing. We've been pushing on it for many years. As I said, we'll continue to push on it. And I think you'll see additional uh, bills released in the next couple of weeks that also get at the same problem, trying to find uh, ways that might be acceptable to the Democratic majority to move operating funds over to transportation to deal with this issue. And Jerry, if I could just add a little detail to what Senator Braun's talking about. In the past, we proposed linking the retail sales tax for automobiles to that fund, and there's a logical nexus there. It also um, increases over time because prices have gone up with uh, rather rampant inflation that we've seen. That increases the money that would come in in, a, in that scenario. And it also increases with population. When people come in, they buy more cars. So uh, there's a there was a practical solution offered several times in the last couple of sessions. It didn't gain any traction, I guess, uh, pun intended. But... Uh, there are better ways to do it than we've been doing it, but just connecting it to a gas tax. Yeah, from the House's perspective, I'll echo a lot of what Senator Braun said. Um, I, I agree. I, I don't think that uh, that's necessarily a, a formal caucus-wide position. I think it is just um, a, an acknowledgement of reality by our transportation lead, uh, Andrew Barkis, that uh, we absolutely need uh, to keep building these projects uh, to ensure that motorists aren't spending more and more time stuck in, in traffic every day. Um, and uh, I, I am confident that uh, raising tolls is uh, certainly not uh, his first choice or the first choice of of any Republican. Um, you know, but unfortunately, the current political realities dictate that uh, our choices are between uh, a series of bad options. Uh, you know, I, I think at this point, it's uh, tolls to keep projects on time or to let the projects languish. Um, the solutions, like Senator Brown alluded to, uh, and, and Senator Wagner, are providing more uh, money from the operating budget to the transportation budget. We have one of the highest gas taxes in the country, 
um, in part because we are one of the only states in the country that does not rely on either general fund revenue or general obligation bonds backed by general fund revenue to help finance road construction. Um, I think that's a mistake. Uh, and I think the fact that the operating budget has more than doubled in 10 years suggests that uh, our state's revenue structure and economy are robust enough to support um, you know, both maintaining social services for the people that need it and providing some support to the transportation budget that um, you know is increasingly uh, facing pressure of uh, lower gas tax revenue thanks to improvements in um, uh, fuel efficiency. Uh, the other thing I'll point out is that you know we we need some change in the executive branch as well. Um, uh, every single minute of my life uh, has been lived under a Democrat governor in Washington State. Uh, the last Democrat governor or the last Republican governor left office a few hours before I was born. Uh, that means that every secretary of transportation has been appointed by somebody from one party. Uh, and I think if you look at uh, all of the failures from DOT over the years um, and how they continually deliver projects over budget and past deadlines suggests that, um, you know, we need to shake things up in Olympia. It's it's time for change. we got to fix what's broken. Uh, and uh, if there were to be, um, you know, Secretaries of Transportation that uh, had different uh, different alliances and allegiances here in Olympia, I think that might go a long way as well. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we got to get some of these projects done, and uh, the majority party is leaving us with very little choices. Yeah, and I'll just add one thing on the appropriation side. Rep. Barkas does have that bill again to move the uh, car sales tax over to the transportation budget. And I know uh, my colleagues on the Republican side and appropriations, we've been pushing for a hearing. We think that that um, is the right thing to do. So that's it's one step in trying to solve this, uh, this problem. Jerry, did you have a follow-up question? Yeah, I guess it, just to pick up on that uh, answer from Representative Corey and the other, if there's a series of bad options and there's opposition to, I guess, would be the road usage charge and a gas tax, what is the Republican game plan if you're successful in repealing the Climate Commitment Act? Um, where do you come up with those dollars? Uh, how do you avoid a gas tax in that in that world? Oh, well, I'd say two things, Jerry. First of all, uh, the idea that, that, that repealing the Climate Commitment Act somehow undermines the, cap the transportation budget is just false. Uh, the, the reality is uh, there is $350 million to go from Climate Commitment Act into transportation uh, under the statute. Uh, but the, the use of that money is extraordinarily restricted. Pedestrian paths, bike paths, some multimodal, uh, and they pay for a small part of the uh, hi hybrid Ferries, you know, that we are uh, struggling to build. Uh, I don't think there's a single citizen in the state of Washington that would notice uh, the impact of transportation if CCA went in what way. I'd also tell you why I don't, you know, tr I, I still believe the right answer for our state is to supplement the transportation budget with the operating budget, uh, like mo most states in the country do. I think if you take out, um, uh, it, it, if you remove CCA from the picture, now you you actually have a potential path for a bipartisan uh, look at a gas tax. So I'm not saying that's what will happen, but right now it's impossible with the CCA. I don't think it's impossible uh, without the CCA. So, uh, and, and just to put it in perspective, uh, by my math, you could, uh, if you got rid of the CCA and you thought that $350 million actually did something, which it doesn't, uh, you could replace it with about a six cent gas tax. So I think most voters would say, I'll take a six cent gas tax instead of a 55 cent gas tax. And by the way, that money will be 18th Amendment protected. So it will go to roads and bridges and, and our, our core transportation system. I don't think that, I don't think that's a deal most folks would walk by. I think they'd be interested in that. Yeah. And, you know, Jerry, I would just add, I think we look at the last transportation package that passed out uh, on party lines, um, and that just shows the kind of the shift in the working here. Um, you know, we've offered a variety of ways to help fund these things. And obviously, um, I would argue that Republicans on the east side of the state are, are concerned about what, you know, what goes on on the west side of the state. I've got um, a lot of goods and services from my district that flow through your, you know, for flow through the Puget Sound onto onto uh, boats and other means of transportation to go around the world. So we all want that. Um, 
I, again, I have expressed support for um, moving some of the operating budget. I think also if you look at actually passing bipartisan um, packages that actually focus on fixing what we need on our transportation package, you could you could see some better movement. But uh, when we're spending money in areas that don't actually help improve roads and don't actually help people get to where they need to go, you're going to continue to see these problems increase, in my opinion. Okay. Next, we will go to Carlene Johnson from uh, Center Square. Go ahead, Carlene. Thank you. First, uh, Rep. Corey, I actually wanted to ask you about your um, uh, legislation, HB 2436, uh, whether or not you might get a hearing on this as an alternate you know, way for some of our local jurisdictions to, to deal with their shortfalls. Yeah, so thank you for the question. Um, so this would be a uh, half a percent reduction in the state sales tax and the state vert collection of it and actually allow cities and counties uh, through voter approval to pick that up to use locally. Um, I am pushing for a hearing. I am not getting any positive feedback right now. I think, uh, you know, this is, in my opinion, a great alternative to just telling cities and counties, go ahead and raise property taxes. Um I think it uh, it's you know net neutral to the taxpayer, which is important for me. Uh, when you look at ballooning budgets, I mean, here in Washington, we've got a three billion dollars surplus. Yeah, if some of our local counties and cities are struggling, um, and we need to give them the options to actually fund a lot of the mandates we've put on them over the years, I think this is a much better way to do it. Um, it's also, I think, a lot more palatable for some of our local leaders. It's really easy for us in Olympia to say, yeah, go ahead and just, you know, we'll, we'll move that cap for you. Um, but that doesn't actually address the realities on the ground that a lot of our local um, elected officials are facing. So, um, again, I'm not confident that uh, we're going to get much movement on this. But um, in a state that has, you know, we're sitting on a $3 billion surplus, uh, we can fund our priorities that we have while also providing, you know, some either, you know, direct tax relief or the ability for cities and counties to not have to come to us asking for money. They can do it directly through that that recapture. And Carlene, I know you didn't direct a question to me, but I have a couple of similar um, ideas to supplant the idea that we need to raise property tax, I'll just give you a quick one. If we just doubled the marijuana revenue that that we give to local governments, we would take about half of the problem away in one fell swoop. So right now, local government counties get 1.5% and municipalities get 3.5%. Remember, that was passed with the promise that the revenue was going to be shared in a way that was going to help everybody. And then we ended up, the state, um, sweeping all those funds to the general funds and reneging on what was an implied promise to local government. And, and that's one way to fix it. And I encourage you to look at the a couple other bills I have on that topic. I will do. Thank you for that. I have one more quick question, if that's okay. Um, when I met with uh, Representative Couture on Friday, he was. Um, very, very upset about the fact that his bill um, dealing with children under state care because of drug addicted parents isn't moving, it sounds like. Um, and I don't remember how many years it's been since DSHS was, you know, split up supposedly to protect kids because social workers were overwhelmed. Now we've got DCYF, but we've got kids still dying, you know, like the the baby in um, Port Townsend a couple of weeks ago. Um, is there any hope that that agency is going to be accountable? Is there are there any bills this session that could uh, address that? I, I think that uh, Representative Couture's bill was one of the few that, that I think got after that problem. We've talked a lot about this. I've talked a lot about this. I mentioned earlier in my comments about Green Hill, and it was 2017. Um, when we we moved that stuff over to the DCY and created DCYF, I remember that because it was it was something that that, that was a uh, it was something we ultimately agreed to to solve the budget uh, negotiations back in 2017, uh, and we had deep concerns over whether this would this would work out, and I think our concerns were justified. It's not working out. Our, our the agency is failing, and instead of taking the problems head on, acknowledging the, the shortcomings both in child protective services. Uh, in the criminal the juvenile criminal justice system I mentioned earlier, in foster care, where kids are being hurt, 
um, or it's a, the agency and the governor are trying to get us to look the other way. They're like, oh, don't look over here. We're taking actions, but they're uh, they're not transparent about what actions. Uh, we continue to see overdoses. We continue to be child, see children uh, hurt or in many cases uh, die because of the lack of attention by our state agency and no willingness in the executive branch to actually take it on. In the end, uh, this really isn't about we don't need a new statute to fix this problem. Oh, we need a governor and a secretary of that department that actually care about kids. Yeah, um, I share uh, Rep. Couture's frustration in this. I mean, the stories are heartbreaking. And, you know, you, you, you ask anyone, do you think uh, children, babies, infants uh, should be left with parents who are in the middle of drug addiction? Uh, and if the answer is no, of course not. Like, it defies logic. Yet here we are. And I'm, and I'm hearing from, uh, you know, some DCYF workers in, in my district that are just really upset about this. They say, no, we're, we're trying to get, you know, help for these children, but, you know, we're basically getting pushback from all these different administrators that are built up. And she goes, we can't find social workers yet. I've got 18 different administrators that are sitting over us. Um, and so, yeah, the frustration is real. You know, my wife and I, uh, we relinquished our foster parent license within the last year just because of what it was becoming like to work with DCYF. So, um, you know, I'm, I obviously wasn't here when it was split. I've been around since kind of near the creation and, and things seem to have gotten worse. Um, and obviously you've got probably, I would say, a bipartisan group of folks that are willing to fix it. But, um, you know, when you when you meet this resistance and you meet a lot of the, you know, the structural barriers that have been put up, you're going to continue to unfortunately see results like this uh, when there are willing people both within the administration or within DCYF as well as uh, within communities wanting to help kids. Um, they're saying, let us, you know, let us help. Uh, and so it's pretty, it's pretty frustrating. One other thing I would add uh, is when we create the department, one of the ways we, uh, we agreed to is we create an oversight board, including several legislators to provide uh, feedback and guidance to to the agency. That board has been completely sidelined uh, by the administration. They they keep them out of any ser serious input on the functioning and effectiveness of the board of the agency rather, uh, and are uh, have turned out to be uh, of of little value in terms of making sure they're doing the right job and taking care of our children. Okay, and next we will go to Jeannie Lindsay with KUOW. Jeannie? Hello, good morning. Um, I wanted to turn back to the initiatives um, now that all six have qualified. Um, I know that Republicans, you, you guys have a lot of support for all of them, but um, I wanted to ask if any of them particularly stand out as especially urgent or important um, to talk more about, um, if, if any of them stand out to you. So... Um, to me, the Climate Commitment Act, um, the gas tax is is the biggest one. It's the most regressive tax that uh, we have um, levied here in Olympia since I know I've been here and I think since some of my colleagues have been here. Um, and it is probably having the most immediate damaging impact on working families across the state bar none. Um, it's obviously the direct cost at the pump, but then there's also all the direct, indirect costs that are being added to our food and other purchases um, while we're already dealing with record inflation, while we're already dealing with, you know, people struggling. And this is just the one more thing that is is being put on them. And of course, you know, the the solution is to repeal it. Obviously, we I would say we all agree with that. Um, uh, the, the alternatives that we've heard from some of our colleagues here, you know, in the form of you know, um, well, we'll just give you a rebate on some of your, your heat costs once. Um, that's not going to actually address the structural issues with that and how regressive this this tax is and how it's hurting Washingtonians. So to me, um, that's probably one of the biggest ones that I think uh, that I, I personally want to see uh, passed and moved along. Yeah, I agree with Representative Corey. That's the one that's at the top of the list in, ter in terms of addressing the issues that we're focused on and, and the issues that people in the state of Washington care about, I would highlight two the, the two of them. That one, uh, which is, again, the most regressive uh, tax we have uh, in our state right now. It's hurting working Washingtonians. You know, the, uh, we're not opposed to, to working on climate issues. We support uh, 
uh, working on climate issues, but to do it on the backs of working Washingtonians just seems ap- absolutely wrong. Uh, the other one that, that is a clear priority for uh, for uh, our caucus is the pursuit bill. Uh, this is uh, a, a, a tragic mistake uh, made by the majority in 2021 that's been a direct contributor to record high uh, crime rates and lawlessness across our state. We got to get back to to a reasonable policy on pursuit, and, and and we know we all know that alone won't fix all the challenges in front of us. But it was one of the key drivers towards the situation we're in, and we're going to have to get, undo it if we're going to get back on track. Yeah, uh, I, I will. I will echo all of that. I, I think the the biggest one, uh, especially for my constituents in South King County, is the Climate Commitment Act. Um, you know, I've, I've said this before, but uh, my, my neighborhood in uh, in very very South Auburn, uh, we're, we're literally about uh, three blocks away from the Pierce County line, uh, so can't get much further away from Seattle and Bellevue without uh, being in another county. Uh, my my neighbors, uh, you know, work as paralegals in downtown Seattle, police officers in Sammamish, school teachers in Bellevue, uh, program managers at Microsoft, just normal working folks making normal uh, middle class income. Uh, they don't choose to live an hour, hour and a half away from their jobs by choice. Uh, they live there by necessity. Um, and uh, it, uh Climate policies that raise the price of gas on working Washingtonians like my neighbors by 50 cents to a dollar a gallon, uh, you know, are really, really damaging. Uh, and so I think in terms of trying to make Washington more affordable, that's that's the number one place we can start. Uh, a, a close second there is uh, making the Long-Term Care Act uh, opt out um, for uh, somebody that makes just the average uh, or a household that makes the average household income in Washington state. Uh, I think would pay about uh, seven, eight hundred dollars a year in uh, long-term care premiums. So uh, that that adds up to real money uh, by the end of the year, and uh, that's another way we can make Washington a little more affordable. And then the last one is exactly what uh, Senator Braun said: uh, fix the pursuit law. Um, you know, we as a legislator should admit that we got it wrong several years ago. Uh, we were well-intentioned, but uh, good intentions. Uh, are maybe maybe necessary, but they're not a sufficient condition for good policy. Uh, and uh, we've seen too many tragedies come to be because police lack the authority to go after the go after the bad guys and and apprehend them. And um, we are facing a public safety crisis in Washington State. And this would be one small way we can try to help get things uh, back on the right track and fix what's broken in Washington. And uh, you should notice that every one of those six initiatives fits into one of the three buckets that Senator Braun talked about as our Republican priorities down here, every one of them. So, and we always talk about public safety first. So that would be my priority. My personal priority is a reasonable pursuit. But uh, beyond that, um, affordability, four of those initiatives fit neatly in affordability. And the last one, the uh, Parental Bill of Rights, applies directly to youth and education. So all of those initiatives fit on under our priorities here. Thank you. And Jeannie, did you have a follow-up question? Yeah, just really quickly, if I may. Um, so Democrats obviously have rejected the motions to require or, or you know, demand that chairs hold hearings on these, but it sounds like they're is still an opportunity if if people come together around a proposed alternative on a particular initiative. Um, so I am just wondering, given that you know you want hearings on these, um, are any people in your caucuses um, looking at talking with Democrats about a possible alternative to any of these initiatives? Um, if so, which one? do you think would be the most realistic for an alternative to come together that that Republicans would support, if if any? I'm just curious on that. Thank you. So uh, I, I can't speak for the House, but in the Senate, uh, the Senate Majority Leader has been clear in several public statements that they were not interested in alternatives. Um, uh, certainly, if there is a, a good faith effort to find an alternative uh, that that he, offers similar help to working Washingtonians uh, across the state we're going to we're going to we're going to talk about that but i want to be clear the grounds are uh, we we think these initiatives as they are 
do the do the most to help folks who are just struggling to make their way in Washington. Uh, if somebody has a better idea, our job is to listen, and we certainly would listen. But we're not going to we're going to not going to sign up for something that doesn't also that doesn't do at least as much to help uh, Washington uh, Washington citizens uh, survive in our state. Yeah, I, I think the position of House Republicans is largely the same. I mean, look, I, th I think every member of our caucus would uh, gladly vote for any one of these initiatives if they were brought to the floor as is. Um, so our position is kind of clear. Uh, we, we'd like to pass all of these. Um, you know, but we also recognize that uh, Democrats don't want to pass those, and there probably aren't the votes right now to pass all of them. Uh, I think that's a mistake uh, on the counterpart of my uh, majority colleagues, but it is what it is. Um, you know, but I think the onus is sort of on them to uh, to say, hey, we don't necessarily like this as is, but have you considered alternative X or Y? And, um, you know, if they were willing to do that, I think we would certainly consider that in good faith. But um, we've already sort of have have our position and we've laid it out, which is uh, these initiatives. So I think the onus is on them uh, to to sort of come forward with with alternative proposals. The other thing I'll, I'll point out is that I think the first step in generating an alternative is holding a hearing, um, letting not just the proponents of these initiatives uh, come and testify and share their stories of why they support them, uh, but let the opponents uh, testify as well and explain what's wrong with these policies. And unfortunately, we're not getting that. Um, you know, look, the best governance comes from uh, different people sharing different ideas and letting the best ideas win out. That's not what's happening right now with the majority party. Uh, there's ideas on the table through these initiatives, and rather than holding hearings and engaging in good faith public debate, the majority wants to uh, prevent any attention or sunlight from being brought on these initiatives at all. I don't think that's a very good way to run the state. It's not a very good way to convince people that uh, you have the stronger position. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's a mistake, and I wish uh, that my counterparts in the majority caucus were doing things a little differently. Okay. And it looks like we are on to our final question, which comes from Drew Mickelson, who had to jump off the call, but left a question for me to ask on his behalf. The move to lower the blood alcohol threshold for DUIs from 0 0.08 to 0 0.05, law enforcement and traffic safety officials support the idea. Are Republicans going to back that effort? And if not, why? I would tell you, uh, our, our, I think our caucus is somewhat split on this issue uh, and people of goodwill come to different conclusions. Uh, some are concerned that uh, the 0 0.05 is not enforceable, not measurable. Uh, they also point out that, look, you can already, you know, if if we can measure that and there is reckless driving, you don't need the current under the current law. People can be arrested uh, if they're causing harm on the road. So uh, there's people that 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 um, position. There's also people who think that anything we can do, even if it's not, you know, it's only even if it's only effective on the margin is another step in the right direction. So this is a this is a tough issue, uh, one that we are not uniform on and one that we'll continue to to discuss as a caucus and as it goes as a bill goes through the process. Okay. It looks like we're ready to wrap up. Senator Braun, would you like to give some closing comments? Yeah, well, first of all, I want to thank everyone uh, for being on this morning. Great, uh, great questions. And I appreciate that. Uh, a lot going on here as we approach the uh, policy cutoff uh, tomorrow and then the fiscal cutoff next Monday. It'll be a scramble as as uh, we try to uh, make sure the best bills make it out of committee. And some of the ones that we have concerns about, hopefully, uh, don't make it out of committee and sit around for another year for more consideration. Uh, it's all Regardless of the, the nature of the bill, it's going to keep us very busy over the next few days. I appreciate the attention that media brings to all these issues uh, and making sure the, the citizens of our state uh, understand that we're here in uh, Olympia fighting for the things that they've told us matter most to them, which is public safety for their families and their communities, uh, making Washington affordable for everyone, and making sure that we have the best future for our all of our kids, uh, regardless of their situation. So thanks again for being here. I look forward to talking to you in the future. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next week.